Hey everyone. Um, so today we're going to continue with the uh, uh, non-parametric methods. So on Tuesday, uh, we talk about <clears throat> when you have a X and Y variable and that uh, relationship between X and Y is nonlinear. Um, and then there are several options. First, uh, you can add a polynomial terms of the X uh, variables. Second, you can do machine learning. And then there are, there's the two methods that we talked about. Uh, one is uh, the kernel regression, which is basically taking the weighted average of all of the Ys. Um, and that weights depends on how close the Xs are to the X uh, you wanna evaluate. And then uh, the second method uh, is the uh, regression splines. And then there's the Mars uh, where you run a different polynomial regression in the different regions of X. Okay. Um, and finally, we also talk about our quantile regression. Um, so today we're just going to uh, do a very simple example uh, to try out these methods and see how they compare. So the data we have um, is called strips. Uh, so that's from uh, either the Fed or the treasury. So what that is, is uh, the price of the bonds uh, for the bonds that don't pay any interest. Uh, so they only uh, pay the principal at the end of the period. Um, and then you have the price uh, for the bonds of different horizons. Um, and that allows you to also estimate the yield curve, which is um, the interest rates over time. So uh, now let's look at uh, the details. Okay, um, so the file is in the folder lecture four um, and the data is this txt file. So it's a <clears throat> pretty small data set. Um, so you have two, only two variables. One is uh, the time. Okay, so you have um, These are the number of years. Um, so that's 0.1 year, uh, 0.6 years, um, which is about uh, seven, eight months. And then you have 1.1 years, et cetera. Um, and then you have the price uh, corresponding with uh, each period. So that uh, is what strips data looks like. So let me show you another example. Um, so these um, are the zero coupon bonds. Um, so you only pay, so there are no interest payment. Uh, you only receive the payment of that $100 at the maturity, okay? Um, and then uh, these numbers are the prices of these bonds. So the data here is from uh, September 2010. Uh, so in September, on November 2010, uh, the price is almost the same because uh, it's still very close to that date. Um, and then uh, five years later, uh, four to five years later, and then that price is much lower. And that's because there is the time value of money, right? Um, so when you receive something in five years, that's always going to be less valuable. So you have to discount that. Um, so that price is lower than $100. And, when, and then uh, when you look at dates that are further and further, so the price uh, drops over time. Uh, and that's always true um, because uh, the time value of money is usually positive, which means that um, the same amount of money, if you receive it today, it's more valuable than if you receive it tomorrow or even later. Okay. Um, so that, that's the same as the data we're gonna use today, except that uh, the data we have is a, an even older data set, it's uh, from December of uh, 1995. Um, and you can see that uh, from the first, from the beginning, it's very close to 100, okay? So the price is, um, which means that if you get paid $100 in about two months, then that's still worth about uh, $99. But then uh, when you go very, very far to uh, 
about 30 years, uh, that price will go down to about $17. So if you receive $100 in uh, 30 years, which is a long, long time um, afterwards, and then uh, that value is much lower, okay? So uh, that's the data we're going to be working with. So this is a pretty small data set. Um, and <clears throat> for these methods, uh, there's usually a lot of computation involved. So um, this is a small data set, so that's gonna be very fast. But uh, if you have a much bigger data uh, and all of these methods are going to take longer. Um, and another thing is in this data, we only have one variable. Okay, so the X variable is the time. Y variable is the price uh, or interest rate. Uh, but all of these methods, they also apply to cases where you have multiple X variables. Um, and when you have more Xs, it's also going to take longer. Um, so I think in the problem set, you will have a slightly bigger data set and that can sometimes take uh, a few minutes uh, to run. Okay, so uh, the first is uh, the usual things. Uh, we import pandas numpy and stats models uh, matplotlib for plotting. Um, and this is a txt file. So you can still read uh, the file just the same way as a CSV file. But um, the first row is the variable name. Okay, so then you have to skip that first row and then to manually add the variable name. Um, and then that would give you this uh, data frame uh, with two variables. One is the time t and one is the price. Um, and there are 117 observations that goes all the way from 0.1 to 28 years. Okay. And then you can also um, look at what is the variation in that data? Um, so before we estimate that uh, yield curve, which is how the interest rates change over time, I wanna just first quickly show you how the kernel density works, okay? So that will give you something very similar to the histogram. So you, you've all seen the histogram, you just use the uh, matplotlib um, hist um, and specify the variable you want to see the distribution of and the number of bins, okay? And that will give you a histogram like this. And you can change the number of bins um, if you wanted each bin to have more observations or less observations, okay? And that will give you um, different histograms. And then kernel density is kind of similar. Um, so it's just a smooth version of the, of the histogram. So here um, you import this function kernel density from the uh, scikit-learn library. And again, we're doing, uh, we're plotting this uh, price variable. And basically uh, what this does is to uh, for it for every point, um, so it has uh, a thousand points between zero and a hundred, and then for each of these a thousand points, I'm calculating what the kernel density is. Okay, so that is estimates the kernel density, and then um, you can plot uh, that density. And the important thing here is also. Um, you need to specify the bandwidth, okay? So this is the bandwidth using a bandwidth of one. And when you are making that bandwidth bigger or smaller, and then the shape will change. So we talked about last time when you make it bigger, it will be smoother or less smooth. Uh, less smooth. When you make it bigger, it will be smoother. Oh, bigger, sorry. 
Yes, uh, before we used one and now we used five, okay? So uh, when you make it bigger, it, you will be counting uh, the observations that's farther away from you, right? And then uh, that will make the whole function smoother because when you go from one uh, value to the next, there will be less of a change because you're incorporating more observations around you. Okay, and then you can see that graphically, right? So this is uh, smoother than what we had before. And then when you make that bandwidth smaller, uh, it will be less smooth. So let's make it 0.5 and there will be more uh, of these <clears throat> fluctuations, okay? But overall, this looks pretty similar, right? To this, um, to this uh, histogram above, okay? And we can actually start that axis from, from 20 because the, I think the lowest value is um, 17, okay? So this, this looks more like the one above, okay? Um, so this, this shows you how to do the kernel density. Um, and it's just a substitute for histogram. It will uh, sometimes look cooler. And then um, when you change the bandwidth, the shape will also be either smoother or less smooth. Okay. And we can also plot uh, that relationship over time. So you can do like price as a function of T. So T goes all the way from zero to 30 years. And the price is very close to hundred at the beginning and then it declines over time. Okay, so this is a pretty monotonically decreasing function, right? So as time goes by, if, um, if you get that, um, hundred dollars in uh, a further away time point and then that value it goes down okay but this is not the yield curve yet right this is only the price as a function of the maturity so now what we want to calculate is using that price to infer what is the interest rate okay so um, for example um, if, we, if, if we go back to the data, okay. Um, so from now to point uh, one, two, I guess it's uh, two months from now. Um, and the price goes from a hundred to 99.3. So what would the interest rate be? So the interest rate is you calculate what is the discount rate, right? Which is um, a hundred, the difference between 100 and 99.3 divided by 100. And that would be about 6%. Um, or you can also use the difference in the logs as an approximate because log returns is very similar to the simple returns, right, for small numbers. So you can also just take uh, the log of 100 minus the natural log of 99.3, uh, and that will also give you about 6%. And then this 6%, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's not 6%, it's 0.6%, okay? Because uh, it's from 100 to 99. Uh, four, so that's 0.6%. And then that's the interest rate between now and two months from now, right? So if you want to get the yearly interest rate, you would just divide that um, or multiply that by six, right? Because a year has 12 months and this is only the interest rate for two months. And if you want to make that interest rate annual, um, and that would be six times higher. Okay, so that would be about 0.6% times um, six or eight, and then uh, you have like four or 5%. So that, that would be your interest rate. 
So the way we do this is for any two observations, we first take the difference in the log of the price, okay? And then divide that by the difference between these two time points. For example, if you look at the second and the third observation, these two, you would use uh, the ratio between these two prices, which is about maybe 2%, um, and then divide by the time that passes between these two points, okay, which is about half a year. And then uh, if that annual interest rate would be about uh, also four or 5%. Okay, so let's do that. Professor. Yes. Going back up. Do you mind going back up a little bit? Yeah. Why would um yeah, why would row 115 have a higher value than row 116? 115 have a lower value, you mean? It has 18.16 and 17.69. Um, so are they not ranked? Let me, let me look at the original file. Yeah, that's a good patch actually. I think there is some uh, error here. So this one should be the last observation, right? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the order is a little bit messed up. So you can also sort the value by T. Yeah, that's a good catch. So this value should be before this value, right? And then this one should be between these two. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't matter too much for the things we're gonna do because the interest rate, we can still just take uh, the difference in the prices divided by the difference in the in the time. But professor, shouldn't the, the, the order be sorted by the time, not by the value? Um, by the time, yes, you should yeah, be. So should the time, if, if for the time the order is right? For the time order, yeah. no, it's not right. Like this 20, 28 is smaller oh, than 29. I see. Yes. Okay. Um, so now um, let's calculate uh, the interest rate. So it would just be first you cut, um, you compute a variable, uh, which is the log of the price. So that would just be uh, the log of that price variable. Okay. Um, and then um, let's call the data X is our X variable, which is the T uh, time. And then uh, the data Y is um, our interest rate, uh, which is the difference uh, in the log price. So that would be this year's price. Um, minus last year's price, which is just the log price and uh, shift one. And you divide by uh, the difference in years, which is um, this year's T. Minus last year's T. Okay. Um, and then there should also be a minus sign uh, because 
for these two, for example, it would be the log of this price minus the log of this price. And then that would be a negative number, right? So you would uh, multiply that by negative one um, and then divide by the this number minus this number. And that would give you the um, interest rate. Sorry, here. Okay. Um, and the other thing we want to do um, is to drop the first observation uh, because this would be the difference between this year's and last year. And for the first observation, there's no last year. Um, so we only keep the um, index from one onwards. Okay, so we drop the one with the index zero. Okay, so that would be our data uh, with the data X being still uh, the time and the data Y uh, is the interest rate. And then we can plot uh, that relationship over time. And what we see would be something like this, okay? Um, it's all around five to 7%. And you can see that this is kind of like a nonlinear relationship, right? So you have uh, increasing first and then decreasing afterwards. Um, so then if you fit a linear regression to this, it would not work very well. Um, and that's, that's the yield curve we have. Um, and you can see that for the most part, it is increasing, uh, which means that um, the long run interest rate is higher than the short, short run interest rate, except for at the very end, um, you have some decreasing relationship. And you can uh, look, look up the like um, yield curve information. So it's all on the treasury website. Um, and they are also calculated based on data like this, where you have the bond prices, and then you use those to infer what is the interest rate. And that yield curve is always changing over time. Um, so for today, uh, we are here. So the one month interest rate is also like 5%. Um, and then the 30 year interest rate is like really high. 1.9%, uh, which is pretty different from what we see here. And then we can go back to 1995, for example. That's um, what our data is, okay, in December. So it will be these numbers. So you can see that there are around 5%. Um, and for the most part, it is increasing, okay, so from 5 to 5.5. 3, 5.4, 5.6, 5.7, 6.1. And there is a little bit of decrease at the end. Uh, I think this is uh, from 20 year to 30 year. Uh, so which is consistent with what we see here, like from 20 year to 30 year, there's uh, a declining. So uh, let's just say we want to um, model this relationship and for any value of time uh, to predict what is the interest rate at that time horizon. Okay, so that's uh, the very simple application that we're going to be working with. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of the actual models is much more complicated than this. Um, so um, in the problem set, for example, what I will be asking you to do is to see what is the relationship between uh, the earnings price, earnings surprises uh, around the earnings announcements and the stock price changes. And that would also be a pretty nonlinear relationship. Um, and then you have to use, uh, also use these methods to estimate that. Okay, so let's um, first, um, so what we'll do is to first split our sample into a training set and a validation set uh, or a test set. Um, and then 
we would estimate whatever model we have in the training set and then evaluate that in the, in the uh, validation set to see what is the out of sample prediction. Okay. Um, so first let's split it into the training and validation set. Uh, so the training set is about two thirds of the data uh, about um, 70, 80 observations. And then the rest about one third of the data is the validation set. Okay, so the first thing we wanna try is the polynomials, which is just quadratic function or uh, even higher order function of axis. Okay. Um, so when you do that using a linear regression, you could just generate another variable, which is uh, x squared, and then regress y on x and x squared. The other way to do this is to use uh, this numpy and uh, fit the polynomial function. Okay, and that will uh, directly give you what is the co uh, regression coefficients. So here we estimate that function using the training set, okay? Uh, which is the X from the training set and the Y from the training set. Um, and then first let's use a quadratic function uh, with only X squared and X. And when we do that, uh, this is the coefficients. So the first is the coefficient for X squared. So this is negative, meaning that uh, this is overall a concave function, right? Uh, which is what we see here. And then uh, you could also plot that function. So here is uh, picking a number of points between the minimum value of X and maximum value of X. Um, so let's pick 70 points evenly spaced. Um, and then for every X, we can calculate um, the value of that function, which is our prediction from that model. And then we can plot um, that value for this validation set. Okay, so, so we're doing two things here actually. Uh, so first these little dots uh, are the scatter plot of the values, predicted values in the validation set. So there are about uh, 30, 40 observations here. Um, and these are the predicted values. And then uh, this is the fitted line of um, this quadratic function. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the little dots are the actual value. So this is plotting uh, the X from the validation set and Y from the validation set. Um, so these are the actual values and your predicted value is uh, the value on this line. Okay. So you can see that uh, it, fits pretty close closely. Um, so that looks okay. And then of course, to evaluate how good that prediction is, we need to use some statistic, right? So the one we would use here is uh, the MSE mean squared error. Um, and with, then we also take the uh, square root of that. So that is called the RMSE, which is the uh, square root of the mean squared error. And we can use this function called mean squared error. We only need to uh, input the actual Y, which is the valid Y and the predicted Y. Um, so that's our first prediction. We call that prediction one. And that will give us the mean squared error, uh, which is about 0.4%. So it's 0.004. Um, which means that um, on average, our prediction is about 0.4% away from the truth. Okay, so that's not a terrible prediction. Um, and then we can compare this with the other models. Okay, um, so the second one are uh, still a polynomial, but we're just changing the degree here. So we go to an even higher order polynomial uh, with x squared and also x to the third degree, okay? So the only thing we need to change here is this number of degrees. 
Um, everything else is the same. We can also do a plot. Okay, so this function here is not quadratic, but it's a high, even more nonlinear function. And you can see that the fit all seems to be better, right? Um, and you can also look at what is the um, root mean squared error. And that is 0 0.0038, which is smaller than before, right? Um, so that's an improvement. And then we can go to an even higher order of polynomial, okay? And you would know that when you go to an even higher uh, order of polynomial, the out of sample prediction is not necessarily better, right? Because that you have the overfitting problem, you're trying to fit all of the noises in the training set. So then when you go out of sample, that prediction might, may not be always better. Um, and so let's see what that looks like. So this is um, the function that you're predicting. And then the RMSE is 0 0.0041, which is actually higher than this one above, right? This is 0 0.0038. Um, so here we do um, have that overfitting problem. Uh, when you go to this higher order polynomial, the uh, out of sample prediction actually becomes worse. Okay. So now the winner uh, so far is this um, third degree polynomial function. Okay. So now let's try uh, some of the things that we've learned. Um, so first we have uh, the regression splines. Okay. So there are the naive way to do it and the more uh, sophisticated way to do it. The naive way to do it is just you specify uh, what is the knots you want. So the knots are the cutoff points and between e e each cutoff points, uh, you would have a different um, polynomial function and you specify what are the cutoff points you want and what is the degree of the polynomial you want. Um, and then that will fit um, a different polynomial function to each region of X, okay? So here, for example, uh, the most natural way, of course, is to just uh, use the evenly spaced cutoff points. So we have uh, the time from zero to 30. So let's just pick the cutoff points to be 10 and 20. Okay, so that cuts it uh, evenly into three regions, right? And then let's also pick uh, the degree of that polynomial to be three. So for each uh, of the three regions, we fit a different polynomial function to the third degree. Um, and that's what this does here, okay? So we can fit that and then um, also calculate the prediction, just using the predict. Um, and we can then also calculate the RMSE, uh, which is taking the actual Y and the predicted Y. Now let's call it prediction three. From there, you can see that the RMSE is 0 0.0042, which is actually higher than what we get from the polynomials, okay? Um, so that may be just because the, the knots we pick are not great. So if you look at the actual graph, um, you should pick the knots to be where there is a change in that function, right? So where do you think we should pick the knots? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 17, 18. 17, 18, okay. Um, is that the only one or do you wanna pick another one as well?
25. 25, okay. Uh, so let's pick 18 and 25 and see if we get better results from there. Um, oh, we're here, okay. Um, so everything else is the same. Uh, let's call it prediction four. So we said seven, uh, 18 and 25. Okay. Um, Okay, that's it. Everything else is the same uh, except for the cutoff points. Okay, so we change to a slightly different cutoff points and let's see what is the prediction. So it does get better. Uh, so we now have 0 0.0039, which is indeed lower than this one, but still uh, I think it's very close to the one we get the third polynomial. Um, let's just try 17. See if it's different. Okay, it's about the same. I think 18 is actually better. Okay. Um, so now we can also plot uh, those functions. So the sec second set of points we pick is 18 and 25. You don't have fit one and fit two defined. Yep. Okay, so I think I should call this one fit one and call that one fit two. I have to change this one too. Yeah, because for the graph, we also want to fit uh, the values to a range of the axes, um, not only the ones in the validation set. Okay. Um, again, these dots are the actual um, values of the Y for the test set. And then these two lines are our predicted values from the regression spline, okay? And, and the blue line is the one with the knots at 10 and 20. Um, and the red one is the one with the knots at 18 and 25. And the second one kind of fit better um, than the first one. And you can see that there is some kind of a break here, right? So it's one shape here and then another shape here. Um, so that's because we're fitting a different polynomial function to each region. Okay. So the more sophisticated way uh, to do this is using the MARS, uh, which is to iteratively um, pick what other uh, kind of points we want and what order of the polynomials we want. Okay. Question, Professor. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, is there a way to find out the cut points automatically? That's I mean, in the Mars. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so here um, we have this approach where uh, we just start with a constant and then uh, we pick a cutoff point, which allows us to, um, to minimize the mean squared error to have the best prediction possible. And then we can add more cutoff points if that still improves the prediction up until a point where uh, the prediction doesn't improve much. And then we stop 
And then from that set of functions, we uh, cut off, we throw away those functions that does not improve the uh, prediction much. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like the stepwise regression where you decide which access to put into your regression model. Um, okay, so for this, you need a um, library. Uh, you need to install that. That's called uh, the Pi Earth. Okay. So it could take a while. And once you uh, install that, um, you just need to fit the model of Mars uh, to the training data set, okay? And then um, use that model to predict the value of y's for the test set. And then you can also, again calculate uh, the RMSE from uh, your prediction, comparing that with the actual values. Okay, so now we have that. Um, and this is the result we get. It's again, point, um, zero, zero, three, nine. So it's actually a little better, right? Than this one here. Okay. Um, so that's how good our prediction is and if you wanna know what are the functions that we actually choose, um, like what are the cutoff points we actually choose, you can also see um, these two things. One is called the trace. That's uh, the whole process of calculating this model. And then the second uh, gives you a summary of what the functions you end up choosing. Okay, so you can see that uh, it has this approach where it first add the functions that improves the MSE, uh, improves the prediction and reduces the MSE, okay? Um, so that's the first iteration. I think it adds uh, a few functions. So this is number of functions in there, there are three, and then the MSE declines to this number. Um, and then the second iteration, you add another one um, and the MSE doesn't change as much, so it stops. Okay, so the improvement is below threshold. And then the second thing it does to um, pruning, so which means that you throw away some of the functions in the set that doesn't matter for the prediction. And finally, this table tells you what are the functions you end up choosing. Okay. And First, you have the intercept, which is the constant. And that number uh, is about 5%. And then uh, you have this function. So uh, what this function is, is um, it equals to x minus 18.6 if um, x is greater than 18 and it equals to zero if X is smaller than 18. So it's like this check function. Um, and the coefficient of that function is minus uh, this number. And then the third one, um, you have the opposite of that, okay? But this one is actually pruned because uh, when you have that um, and also the X, you no longer need the opposite. Okay, so they're kind of repetitive. So that's actually not in the final model. Um, and then you have uh, the just the linear term of X uh, and that has a coefficient of, of this. Professor, can you explain the second one again? Oh, the second one? Yes. So this one, this function itself, uh, it's equal to like the positive part of X minus 18. So if X is greater than 18, that equals to X minus 18. If X is smaller than 18, it equals to zero. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so then the function you end up getting uh, is 
you have the intercept point of five uh, plus uh, this coefficient 0 0.011 times x, okay? Um, and then plus uh, or minus 0 0.0038 times uh, this h function. So that's about the, the function you get at the end. Okay, so it's still a linear function, actually. It's um, using a very low degree of polynomial, uh, but it has these two different functions in these two different regions. Um, so for this, it would be equal to uh, 0 0.05 plus one x if x is smaller than 18, right? Because if x is smaller than 18, then the second part equals to zero. And uh, the value is just 0 0.05 plus uh, this coefficient times x. But if x is greater than 18, um, that would be plus this number. Um, and then minus So H is an indicator function, right? Exactly. It's not an indicator function because, um, yeah, it's not an indicator function because indicator function is equal to zero or one. But when X is greater than 18, H is just equals to itself, equals to X minus 18. So it's like taking the uh, taking this number, if it's positive, it means equals to itself. If it's negative, it equals to zero. Okay. Thank you. And then you have this number equals to 0 0.05 uh, minus, right, 0.0027 times x, um, and then plus some other constant. Okay, so this is when the case if x is greater than 18. So that's um, that's the function we get here. So we have a different linear function, uh, one that's increasing in x if it's uh, smaller than 18, and one that's decreasing in x if it's greater than 18. Um, and that would allow us to fit this shape, right? Because uh, if you look at this relationship, it's kind of increasing be before 18 and then it's decreasing after 18. And then we can also plot that so you can see exact uh, what that looks like. Um, so first, you could also take that evenly spaced points and sort of uh, to plot this whole function. So it just looks like this. Okay, so that's the function we wrote here you have this increasing relationship with the coefficient of about 0 0.0011 if x is smaller than 18 and um, when it's bigger than 18, it has a negative coefficient of 0 0.0027, like that. Um, and you could also plot, um, so these red dots are the actual values for the test set. And then the blue dots are the predicted values for the test set. Um, so you can see that they are actually pretty close to each other. So that's um, a useful prediction here. And you can see that uh, now what this does is we're still using a linear function, okay? Um, we're not using any quadratic or even higher order terms of the x. Uh, the only trick with does is to have a different linear function for the different regions of x. And that 
already allows us to fit the function pretty well. Okay, so this RMSE uh, is even better than this third order polynomial, right? Um, sorry, it's better than the quadratic function here. Um, and it's very close to this um, cubic function here. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, this RMSE, I think it's still a little bit bigger than that um, cubic function. Um, however, if you have a much bigger data set or if you have much more access, um, and this would be a very powerful thing, okay? So it would be much better than um, either the quadratic or other polynomial functions of X. So just uh, let me show you some examples. So you can find a bunch of examples in this uh, PyR website. So that's the library we just used. Um, so we can see the gallery. Um, so that's all kinds of nonlinear function. For example, you can look at this one. So that is the sine function, right? Which is highly nonlinear. You can never fit that using a sim single uh, polynomial function of X. Um, however, you can fit that pretty well using a uh, regression spline. Okay. And I think at, uh, you have about 20. Functions and uh, you can just use this polynomial functions and uh, at different regions of X and that will allow you to have a good fit of this function. And you can see all kinds of other nonlinear function too. Um, and this is still single variable. And if you have more variable, uh, it can also iteratively choose what are the interactions between the variables. Okay, so that's Mars. Um, and then, so, and then you can also find more uh, examples of this on this website if, um, if you need you use something else beyond uh, what we have here. Okay, and finally, uh, the kernel regression. So the kernel regression, um, you have a function just in this uh, stats models and you can just fit that to the training data set. Um, and you choose the variable type to be continuous and that will use cross validation to optimally choose the bandwidth, okay? So we talk about the leave one out cross validation um, for each observation, you fit the kernel regression to the all the rest of the observations and then um, calculate what is the RMSE for that observation. And then you do it N times and take the average. Okay, so that's the process it takes here to try to select that optimal bandwidth. Um, so this can take some time if your data is big, okay. Um, and then you can see what is the bandwidth it chooses. And that is 0.7, okay. Um, and then you can uh, fit that model to our test set and calculate the RMSE from this model. If you run that, you can see that this has so far the best performance, okay. So the RMSE is point. Uh, 0037, which is lower than um, all the things we had before. Um, so this by far gives us the best prediction um, in that test step. Okay. Um, and finally, we can also plot uh, what are our functions look like. So first uh, we can plot the prediction uh, in the valid set. And you can compare that with uh, the actual values. So I think the blue dots are the predictions and the uh, 
these clear dots are the actual values. So they're really close to each other, right? And then you can also fit that uh, function to this uh, evenly spaced points along the X axis. And that allows you to plot this whole function. Um, so that is our kernel regression. Okay, it's entirely coming out from the data. Uh, each point, the value is just a weighted average of otherwise with the weights uh, depending on how close or how far it is from the X. And this can take any shape. This one here is very nonlinear relationship, but um, it actually fits the model pretty well. Okay. And because it uses the cross validation to choose um, to choose that best optimal bandwidth. Um, so this will also usually have a very good out of sample prediction. So you won't have to worry about the uh, overfitting problem. Okay, so we've seen for all of these models. Um, so here the difference is not huge, right? So they are all kind of having a similar um, performance as the polynomials but um, this is just a very small illustrative sim uh, example. And in most cases, um, you would have uh, the Mars and the kernel regression being the best models. Um, and then depending on the specific case you're looking at, either one can be uh, the best um, or maybe machine learning is better than those two, uh, but not always. So you should always um, try uh, all of these models if you have a nonlinear relationship and see uh, which one allows you to fit the data the best. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, so uh, I will just let you go a little early today uh, because we have that problem set to you today. And uh, I know it's also the Chinese New Year and a lot of you are celebrating. Um, and we, I've also posted the second problem set. Um, so you can see that already under the uh, problem set to folder. Um, so you have two questions. One is using um, the non-parametric methods. And uh, the second is uh, the survival analysis, which we're gonna talk about uh, next week. Okay, and this one is due in two weeks. So it's the Thursday, two weeks from now. Okay, so I will be here uh, until the usual ending time 850. Um, so if you have any questions about the problem set, um, I'm happy to answer those. Okay, uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, you are welcome to leave. So Professor, you, you just mentioned that we, we do not need to worry about the uh overfeeding problems in terms of kernel function. Can you just repeat the reason again? I, I missed it just now. Because it already, Wait, right? yes, because it already uh, chooses the optimal bandwidth using cross validation. So it already uh, optimizes the out of sample prediction. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just like the Mars is also, um, so when it chooses the uh, cutoff points, it already takes into account that it wants to have the best prediction. But for polynomials, you're just um, looking at 
like uh, a degree of polynomial. So when you have a big, very big, very high degree, then you might have an overfitting problem, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Professor, I have a question uh, in the problem set one. Okay. Question three, question three, 10. 